Good morning. Okay, thank you. I got you guys cheer for, you know, to give offering, okay? You got to be able to say welcome back to me, okay? All right. Hey, real one thing. Chris, I know you're watching right now. I am not to blame for you. That's all I got to say, all right? You cannot blame me for him, all right? Um, I tried my hardest. Well, you just got what you got. Okay. No, I'm kidding. I love Chris. I love Hannah. I love their beautiful girls. Um, I, Chris is a, uh, you know, I started out as his youth pastor and then kind of a mentor. And Chris is just a brother and a friend and, and one of my closest friends. And uh, I, the only, my only regret right now in terms of my relationship with Chris is that I don't still live here in Arizona. And uh, so I don't get to see him as much as I would want to. Now, I, I wore my Cardinals jersey. I live in California. And when I wear this, it's not always welcomed warmly. And so I was hoping as I wore this that people would enjoy, except for the Steelers, you know, a guy in the back, okay? Not sure, too sure about your taste. I don't know you. I'm not going to judge you, all right? But I wouldn't have walked into this room with that on. That's all I can say, right? Okay. Anyways, I am uh, really grateful that uh, I get to be here today with you and uh, I get to share. I, it's amazing to me that Chris has uh, been here for just about 10 years. Uh, this is 10-year anniversary coming up soon, I think. Yeah, uh, you can clap for that. That's okay. <laughs> I hope you clap for that. All right. Um, and uh, and, and I, think this is, I think this is about my eighth or ninth time that I've got to share with you. And when I, we lived here in Arizona, I really saw this as my second church family. Now, I, I've gotten to meet and to know and to love so many people that are a part of this body here. And, and whenever I'm here, I always feel like I'm at home. And, uh, and so I'm just, I want to thank you ahead of time for allowing me to come and to share with you right now. Now, as I think about this year, 2020, um, I, I don't know about you. I don't know how you were feeling leading up to 2020, okay? Like, for me, we live in the high desert. But even though we live in the desert, something happened last year that has never happened in the, you know, we've lived there for about 15 years, you know, combined years over different times. It snowed on Thanksgiving Day, and it snowed on Christmas Day last year. And I just thought, oh, man, this is amazing. What a great end. It's, gonna, it's just going to launch us right into a, an amazing 2020. It's just going to be better than ever or anything. And, and what I really think happened was God was like, guys, some stuff is coming, so here's a little gift, okay? That's what I think God did for us. And, um, and we know that 2020 has been difficult, so far, beyond um, what we could have ever imagined. I mean, we've got COVID-19, where millions of people worldwide have been affected. Nearly a million have died, and, and, and thank God the majority of the people are recovering from it when they get that. Um, we have wildfires right now in California. It seems like most of California is on fire right now. Um, hurricanes on the East Coast impacting people by the thousands. Um, we have a um, civil unrest and racial um, tensions that have been um, going on this entire year. And, and it doesn't matter what side you're on, this is a fact that these things are going on. And a presidential election, which is always a fun time, okay, um, to, during that, okay? And, and, and with all of this, there are people feeling a lot of different things. Fear, uneasiness, um, a little timidity. Uh, there's a lot of people who are out of work that were not out of work um, this time last year. There are people who have been sick. There's people who are worried about people that they love getting sick. Um, there is just a lot that is happening right now. And, uh, but the silver lining, Starbucks drive through is still open, okay? Um, I mean, so at least you can have some normality there, all right? But let me just say this. With all of this going on, with all of the, the tensions that are happening... We, I believe, have to come to a place where we make room in our lives for God in, in a way maybe that we haven't done before. That, that, that we turn to him and that we understand, you know, what he's doing. And I think in order to do that, we need to kind of clean ourselves out of some things that maybe aren't necessary to make room for some things that we really need. I, I, let me just ask you this. How many of you have a junk drawer in your kitchen? Okay. 
have a junk drawer. And a junk drawer is that, that thing that just beca- gets full of the miscellaneous stuff. For whatever reason, I had one growing up. From the time I can remember, there was a junk drawer right by the door going into the garage, open it up, and it was just filled of stuff. Now, when I got married and my wife and I were setting up our new home, we didn't say, okay, the cups are going to go place here, and, and let's just make this drawer the junk drawer. Okay, that, that's not what we did, but it just kind of happened. Okay, it's just going to happen when there's a drawer. Oh, I'll just set this here for now. Isn't that what it is? It's not like, this is where it goes. Oh, let's put this here for now. And, and, and then all of a sudden, oh, I'll put this here for now. I just looked at my junk drawer. Now, my first junk drawer is about this wide. My current junk drawer is about this wide. Okay, I'm older. I have more junk. All right? And so it needs a larger drawer. There was two hammers. Okay? There was like multiple screwdrivers. There was string and crayons. My youngest child's 26. I don't know why there's crayons there, okay? Um, I mean, there are matches, there's coloring books. I like the color. And um, it's it, it just all kinds of stuff. Just a lot of stuff. You know what I did just then, before I came? I cleaned it out. I started putting things away where they need to go, okay? Because a junk store is like, oh, I don't want to go in the garage. Boom, boom, and close it. Don't want to think of that now. But I think we need to do the same thing in our lives. You know, there's a quote by um, St. Augustine. It says this. Um, we must empty ourselves of all that fills us so that we may be filled with what we are empty of. There are things in our lives that we need to kind of clean out so that it makes room for the things that we really need. And I want to talk to you maybe about some of those things today. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, how we can get rid of things. And there's a term I'm going to talk about called benevolent detachment. Benevolent detachment. Okay, and I'm going to tell you what that means. You're going to know what it means at the end. I'm a teacher, seventh grade science teacher, and I always say stuff at the beginning. I go, but guys, by the end of today, you're going to understand exactly what this means. Okay, and so that's what I'm telling you right now. Benevolent detachment. If you're in my class, I'd make you say it with me, but I'm not going to make you do that, okay? But you'll understand what it means in just a minute. Now, I would say that this has to do with us walking away or detaching or, or moving away from things, not so much physically, but emotionally, soulfully, spiritually, that maybe aren't the best for us. And I would say it's turning over what is burdening us to God and leaving it there. And that's, that's not an easy thing to do, right? <laughs> so you're like, God, would you just do it? I'm going to give this to you and walk away, and I'll never think about it again, right? That's not easy to do. It's not what we normally do, even though we would love to. Now, detachment just means to untangle. That's what it means. To, to untangle, stepping out of a predicament, um, a quandary, a quagmire, being able to peel ourselves away from people and situations and, and, and maybe even global crises that are attaching themselves to us in an unhealthy way, in a way that's not benefiting us, and in a, in a way that, that it just wears us down. You know what benevolent means? It's kindness. Just kindness acts of love and compassion. That's all it means. And um, it really, ha- let, me say, let me say this, the answer to this, the answer to being able to do this, and I'm not, I'm not saying this because I'm a pastor, because um, we're in church, but because it's the truth. And the answer in our ability to do this is Jesus. It's him. And it's not just because Jesus is Jesus, now, but it's also just who Jesus is because he is the one who did this better than anybody has ever done it. And he's given us the example, and he also wants to emp- help to empower us to be able to do that through his presence in our lives right now. Now, when, um, when I was given, they said, yeah, I want you, we want you to preach out of something in Philippians chapter 2 when I, when I was coming here. And I was excited because Philippians chapter 2, especially the very first part, is one of my favorite passages ever. And so I want to read them to you right now. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 says this, If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if any um, fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete, being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness, or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Don't just look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
who although, um, I just lost my place in my mind, um, who is in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality of God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Get that, guys. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross. It says twice that he humbled himself. So he emptied himself. You know, it's amazing, you know, when we, when we look at this, and we look at Jesus and who he was, what stands out to me in this passage, probably more than any other, is just his humility, his willingness to walk away, to untangle himself and detach himself from holding. Understand that Jesus created everything, the world, the universe, and, and it says, in Psalm says he holds it in his hands, this universe, like this, this thing that he controls. And he stepped away from that to be a toddler that learned how to walk. Have you ever thought about that? What Jesus left and what he came to, he, um, he left, he walked away from uh, his glory. He walked away from his honor. He walked away from the perfect praise of everything in heaven that was directed towards him to be born in a stable surrounded by shepherds and the smell of animal feces to come into this world. He emptied himself, it says. That term, empties himself, is, is the word, is this uh, kenosis, which means to renunciate. To, and basically what he did is he, he renounced his divinity to become a man. So when he completely emptied himself of all of his glory, he looked like us. That's kind of humbling, isn't it? And when he walked away and emptied himself of everything that he was, all of his glory, his divinity, then he looked like us. Now, when he began his ministry... Um, he did something really interesting. His cousin John, the, um, we call John the Baptist, that wasn't his last name, but um, John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan, and Jesus went to be baptized. And, and John, knowing who he was, said, I should be baptized by you. I shouldn't be baptizing you. And, and, and here's Jesus humbling. He goes, John, this is, this is what's supposed to happen right now. I'm just going to do it. And he was baptized. And then when he, was, when he came out, and there's that pronouncement from heaven that says, God speaks. And we don't know everyone there, if everyone heard it, but, but, but there are people who heard it. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, God was, growing up, I used to think, oh, God was happy that Jesus got baptized. No, no. I mean, yes, but no. God was happy with Jesus. And what he left to come down to earth all he had been up until that time in his life, because Jesus just didn't become Jesus at the point of his three-year ministry. He was Jesus as a child, as a teenager, when he was a carpenter, caring for people, loving people. You know, I always like to think of Jesus when he was in Nazareth, because he, he was the God-man at that time, too. And he probably was like this guy that, they like, oh, Jesus, he's just so neat. He's just so great. I mean, he's such a good listener. He has compassion. He, he always seems to have the right thing, right advice. I can imagine a little kid who has a cold, and he, Jesus have compassion. He'd go, it'll be okay, and then, boom, he heals him, and then no one knows, okay? I mean, I could just imagine Jesus doing things like that. Why not? Why not? We saw that over and over in his ministry, that he couldn't help himself because he was moved with compassion and, and sympathy for people. That's who he was. And so that's why, Jesus, that's why God says, I am well pleased, also because he knew what he would eventually do. And then, you know, he went on this, like, 30-day solo out in the wilderness. And when he came back, the very first thing he did was invite us to join him in what he was doing. I mean, he could have said, oh, I'm, God, I'm the God man. I'm going to take care of everything. No, but he, he gathered people around, 12 apostles. Um, it, it, sometimes, at different times of ministry, there was hundreds of people following him. Um, of his apostles, there were three that were very close. At the end, there were 120 people up in the, up in, you know, the upper room to pray. Um, and, and then after he, uh, he came back and he ascended, there was the apostle Paul, and there was Barnabas, and there was Titus, and there was Timothy, and all these other people that joined in. And all the centuries of the church coming together, all of us have been a part that he's invited to be a part of what he's doing and what he's all about. And you know, I, I love the passage in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. I want to share with you. It's out of the message, but I love, I just, I just love how it is put. It says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned down on a religion? He says, come to me. 
get away with me and you'll recover your life. And I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn un, the unforced rhythms of grace. I, I, lay, um, I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. Listen to this. Keep company with me, and, as, and you will learn the, to live freely and lightly. You will learn to live freely and lightly. And then in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, he says, um, Live carefree before God. He is most careful with you. Live freely and lightly. Live carefree with God. When was the last time you were carefree? I can't, I, I, I can't remember the last time that I was carefree, without care, without concern, without some sort of tension, without some sort of something going on. But he said, Jesus says, I, I want you to learn to live freely and lightly, carefree, and I'm going to be careful with you. Can we look at this world and all the things that are going on and just let it go? Can we let it go? Because sometimes it can seem assuming. So it, it will attach itself to us. And the enemy wants to attach so many things. They're going to worry us and get our minds away and on things that isn't the main thing. And be angry at people maybe who don't agree with us or, or be frustrated with situations that are out of our control. And, and, and just are, do we have the ability to let those things go? To, to not be consumed by them? Because this, I just want to let you know, it's not your job to deal with it. You can't save the world. That's not your job. That's God's. And you can't save the world, but you can make a difference in your world. You can make a difference in your world. Now, your world being all the people that you interact with in your life is your world. All of those people. And it's not, and it's, it's all, some of our worlds overlap, but every one of us live in a very unique world unlike anyone else's world because we don't all deal with the exact same people not even when you with the people you live in your own household with not even the person that you're married with we all have a unique world we live in and and guys it is um how we are able to not just survive but thrive in that world that makes a difference and i'm talking talking about happiness happiness is just a good feeling you get from circumstances you may find yourself in it's short-lived i'm talking about joy Joy is, is, this, is this thing that, that we experience, this confidence, this calm, this... It's even something you can't even truly describe. But when we're in God's hands and we're trusting in Him, it's something that we can experience even during some of the most difficult and painful parts of our lives. If you've been around, and, and like I said, I've shared several times here, I, I think I've probably shared about my daughter Molly. And when I was, um, when I was a youth pastor for Chris and Hannah... Um, and Heather, um, they, um, my, my, she passed away. She was a year and a half old, and, and that was a difficult time. And, and uh, on the day of her, of her funeral, um, after the, all that was done, we went back to our house, and, and there were people that had been part of our lives who were there with us, some people from that church. Um, I had been at two other churches before coming to that church, and some friends from Illinois flew out for that, and we lived in California. Some people from Lancaster came down. I had some, some friends who lived in Northern California that were roommates of mine in college and that just said they couldn't make it. But then at the end, they just said, we can't not come. And they drove nine hours to come down for the funeral. And then they, they, they came over. And I hear all those people in my home. And I was just kind of sitting back in the corner in this area. And I was just watching them. And they were enjoying each other. They were enjoying each other. They were talking laughing they were enjoying each other all these people in different different times of my life and different parts of my life were here together and and molly did that it's not the way i wanted her to do it but she did it and you know what i had joy at that moment it wasn't happiness it was something deeper but i, I had a calm and i and, and i and i really believed god thank you i was thanking god for what was going on right at that moment and for us to be able to do this, especially during times like the times we're living in, I want, to, I want to share with you maybe a few things that you can do, I think, that will help, okay? And the first thing is that, is that we need to make our time with God a priority. 
Now, our time with God isn't just in one way. Reading the Bible and prayer is important and vital to our lives and our health and our walk with the Lord. But let me just say, it's, it's more than that. And, and we are all different and we're all unique. And, and you know, I, and God will speak to us in many different ways and in many different avenues. And, and so, you know, whether you are reading the Word or you're reading a book or an author that really touches you and grabs hold of you and actually even draws you closer to God and, and the way you feel about him. Journaling, listening to your favorite teacher or speaker. You know, the beautiful thing about the internet is there's, there's all amazing communicators out there that we can listen to and, and that God can use in our lives. Maybe reading a, a blog or a podcast and listening to that you really love. Watching a movie. I mean, there's movies that just move me in a very deep and real way and wanting me to, you know, move into a different place with God in, in areas of my life. Um, listening to music. Man, there's music. When, when I drive to work in the mornings, um, I, I listen to worship music, and I'm just sitting here singing cra like crazy in my truck as I drive for 10 minutes, and, and it's good that I'm alone because you guys would hate to be there and hear listen to me sing, okay? But I do it for myself. I work with seventh graders. I need that time, okay? So um, it's important for me. And then on the way home, I listen to Lord of the Rings because yeah, I love Lord of the Rings. So anyways, I really love that time. And um, Oswald Chambers says this. He says, we are not built for ourselves, but for God. Not for service for God, even though it's important. And we're talking about serving for God, okay, during this time. But it's not just for service for God. Didn't, God didn't create us just to serve him. He created us for him. You guys got that? I mean, we were built and created for God because God wanted us. God chose us, and in return, God wants us to choose him. And not just a one-time decision. He wants us to choose him every day. Spend time with him. To listen to him as he speaks to us, and as he listens to us when we speak to him. I mean, I... I I choose my wife every day to spend time with, and I, and I want her, and I want her to choose me in return. Not just, you know, when we got married, you know. When we got married, I told her I loved her, and, and if it changes, I'll let her know. So I don't need to tell her again. That's not how we do things, right? Okay, I mean, I tell her every day that I love her and that I care about her. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's part of what we do. And, and for God, it's the same. We make time for him, a priority. And we need to appreciate the moments of our lives. You know, let me just say this. The older I get, I used to listen, especially as like your guys' age, okay, here and here, all right? And I'd hear people my age, old people, say these things to me, yeah, 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 whatever, get over it, okay? But I, the older I get, the more I kind of simple our minds get. And I don't know about you who are maybe get a little older like me. The, the older you get, the more you realize, and the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. I don't know if that's you, if it's me or if it's you as well, okay? But actually stop and actually smell a rose okay you talk about the expression stop and smell the roses do it you're walking by something you see a rose stop and smell it something fragrant stop and enjoy it watch get up early and watch a sunrise <laughs> i know in the in the Rusin household <laughs> sunrise is not an 11 i just want you to know that okay all right get up early and actually watch a sunrise stay up late you guys can stay up late watch a sunset it's beautiful something God gave us. It's gorgeous. The moments that we have, be present with, with and it, anyone that you happen to be with at that time. Be present. Don't be thinking about what you just did or what's coming next. Just be there. Be present in that time. And let me encourage you to stop regretting things of the past or, or being worried about things in the future because we can't do anything about those things. You can be present right now in the moment you're in. Because isn't that what our life is built on? Our life is built on all the moments that we experience on this earth with the other people who are on this earth. So be present with those. Take advantage of what's in front of you. Uh, several years, years ago when I was a youth pastor, um, I, I, was, I, was, I was doing a series wanting p the kids that are in my group to understand just how important it is to not just tell people about Jesus, but to show God's love in different ways. And we talked about, you know, the way we serve one another is an amazing way to show that God loves you. And um, that's why I love that, 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 that this month is all about service here, because it's just not service to do things for one another. It's a way of expressing and showing God's love. 
And, and so we, I decided we were going to do this. And I, we had volunteers. Now, we, were, we had, a, a, at this time, a good, good-sized youth group. And, you know, we would go to all-nighter stuff. We'd have 100 kids come. And it was great. But um, when we did what I'm going to do, we had about 10, okay? And so um, we had this area with a lot of businesses on either side of this road right by our church. And so we split ourselves into two teams. And I had five high schoolers. There were three girls and two guys because, let's be honest, girls are more committed than guys. And um, they're with me. And, and so we were going from, like, America's Tire Company and Marshalls and, and, and Costco and El Pollo Loco and all of the, you know, um, all these different businesses that were there. And we were going and saying, hey, we'd like to, we'd like to wash uh, your bathroom, clean your bathroom. And they're like, what? You know, and so our, our, this is what we were doing. And they said, well, why? And we said, well, we're from this church over here. And we just want you to know that God loves you. And we just want to show you in a practical way and just take care of this for you. Would you let us do that? Now, a lot of us have said no. <laughs> the guys from America Times were like, yeah, do it, man. It's bad. Okay, they were happy to have us do it, okay? But we came to Marshall's and went in and said this to this girl. And this girl goes, oh, let me get my manager. And so the manager comes out. And, and so I tell her what we want to do. And she says, why? And I tell her what I just said. And she goes, well, we have a company that comes in and does that. You know, I said, well, we can do it. And then they can they come in. They'll be done. And then they can just be here for a few minutes. And no, no, that's okay. I said, and then it just something in me just thought, well, can we, is there anything in your life that we can pray for you about? And she just kind of, kind of looked at me and paused for a second. She, and she kind of set, you know, moved me over. She was well, and she began to tell, with me, tell me about just some issues with her daughter and you know, some of their relationship, other, other issues. And, and, and I said, well, yeah, we'd love to pray for you. We'll do that. We'll pray for you. So I walked out. And I said, hey, we're not going to um, do, you know, clean the bathrooms, but we're going to pray for the manager. She's got some stuff. So we just got circled up, all, all six of us, and, and we just prayed. We just prayed for right then outside Marshall's and, and for her, her relationship and just these other things. And we got through, and one of the kids said, David, look behind you. And, and she was standing like five feet behind me, and her mouth was open, and she said, you were praying for me. I go, well, of course. I'm not going to tell you I'm going to pray for you and not do it, okay? Of course we prayed for you. And she started weeping and started crying. And she goes, I know. I walked away thinking, well, they're not going to pray for me. I know he said he would, but he's probably not. And we just began to talk to her and started asking about our church. And, and like a month later, she gave her life to the Lord, and it was just, it, it was just that moment. It was just a moment that was right there in front of us. And we just took advantage of that moment. We didn't know what would come after that moment, but we're going to take advantage of those moments that we have. And, and then to get caught up in, in what I'm going to call the flow, and, and it was, I, I, there were some Native American people who were coming to this church, actually several families, and, and I didn't know anything about Native American culture, and so I wanted to read some books and, do, and, and to find out some things. And there's this thing called a flow, that they experience they, they talk about in their spirituality but for me this flow is being and doing what god created you to be and to do this flow it's like it, it is what you do when you do it you lose track of time because you, it's what you love to do it's your passion it, it whatever it is you know what is in your life right now it, you know if if we are children of god i hope you understand it's about seeing others not for who they are to you, but for who you can be for them. See, we are all someone's experience. When we interact with someone, we are part of their experience. So what type of experience do they get from you? What is the experience they have when they have an experience with you? It should be the experience that they would have if they were experiencing Jesus. You know... I, I think about the experience. I think about a story, and I've got a few minutes here. I'm probably going to go a few minutes more than the few minutes. But sorry, Chris, but you asked me to come. Anyways, um, Jesus' first miracle in John chapter 2 is a miracle in Cana. And I'm going to go through this kind of quick because I want to get to the, fi- to the points that I want to make. And, and, and he's at this wedding, okay? And, and by the way, Jesus, I believe, loved weddings. I mean, when he created the universe, he created a relationship with man and him. And the very next relationship he had was a romantic husband-wife relationship. So he loves weddings, okay? I believe that. He created them. So he's at this wedding with his girls, and his mom was as well, okay? And all of a sudden, something horrible happened. What happened was they ran out of wine, Okay, and it was not near, nearly close to the end of this celebration. And the celebrations, understand, in the Jewish culture lasted for hours, okay, into the night. And this is an embarrassing, I mean, a dishonorable thing, basically, to run out of wine. And so all of a sudden, Mary found out about it, and she went to Jesus and said, Jesus, they're out of wine. 
And Jesus goes, what do you want me to do? Okay. He goes, listen, it, I'm not, it's not my time yet. He goes, it's, I'm, not, I'm not here to start doing that stuff. See, so understand, Mary knew who Jesus was. Make, make no mistake about it. She knew where Jesus came from better than anybody, okay? And she knew Jesus growing up and saw all the things he did that we didn't see. She knew Jesus. So Jesus says, what do you want me to do about it? And then she just turns to the people who found out, these people who were serving at the wedding, who, who found out that there was no wine, and they said, do whatever he tells you to do. Okay, that's what she tells them to do. And so he goes, all right. See those six water pots? Just fill them with water. Now, hold on a sec. Because those people are thinking, okay, we need wine. He's going to tell us how to get the wine. And then he looks at them and says, fill up those pots, not with wine from over there, but with water. And they're like, Okay, if we need wine, then this whole water thing isn't going to work, okay? I mean, think about these servants and how ridiculous this, this thing was that the Jews asked them to do. We need wine. It was not water they needed, but wine that they needed. And so Jesus goes, no, do it. Now, these water pots were like 20 to 30 gallons, and, and um, they were used for purification purposes, and, and this just didn't make sense. But let me just say to you, sometimes it's difficult to do what Jesus is telling us to do because oftentimes, I don't know about you, it's a little confusing what he's asking us to do. And sometimes in our thinking, in our vision, from what we can see, it doesn't make sense. But we have to trust that Jesus sees something more than what we see. And, and, and the servants that day had a choice to make. They could do what Jesus told them to do and fill these pots with water when they need wine or not. That was their choice. And Jesus was commanding them also to do something that was a lot of work. So let's just say there's 25 gallons in each one. That would equal 150 gallons of water that they would be taking, not from turning on a spigot with a hose and filling them up, but from a well, they'd have to drop a bucket in and, and pull it out and then go dump it in these things. And if they had a five gallon, you know, bucket, which is a heavy bucket, it would be 30 different trips okay, to fill up all of these with water. That's a lot of work. I'm going to tell a story real quick, okay? Um, I, I was in ministry for near, almost just too shy of 30 years. And I was in a point in my life where I just, I, I, I just didn't have a passion anymore. There was things that were going on, and, and it was hard. And, and, and I thought, God, I feel, I feel like I'm going to have 20 more years of my life to work what do you want me to do? And, and through a, a lot, big story, I felt like God was saying, well, what do you want to do? And I thought, if I'm going to spend 20 years doing something, I just miss kids. I love kids. If I have a passion, it's for students. It's, it's just, I, I love working with them. Absolutely love. So I decided to leave uh, church ministry and become a missionary on a, what ended up being a junior high school campus. And so I am a, a seventh grade science teacher right now. Now, when I made that change, um, and we moved from here to California, and I went to school to start getting my um, de degree, um, we went from whatever we were making here, basically we were making um, about $60,000 less than what we were making when we left the job here we were doing. Um, I was working at a high school. After that year, I was a long-term sub. They wanted to hire me, but then someone came in with a credential, so they had to hire them. Another school said, well, we'll hire you, but it's going to be a long-term sub, and then maybe something else. And we were out of money, and it was like, okay, God, maybe you have to do a second job. I'll do a second job. And, and then right around that time, my dad did not well, and right at that moment, he passed away. And I was sitting there, and it was, didn't make sense at that moment, I have to be honest with you, in my, in my mind. It was too difficult, I felt, at that moment. Do you know that 150 gallons of water that Jesus was having them do? Um, do you know how many bottles of wine that is? Just thought I'd tell you. Okay? 150 gallons of water with a normal bottle of wine is 757 bottles of wine. 757 bottles of wine. So when there was a wedding going on, and um, people were already a little tipsy, Jesus added in another 757 bottles of wine, okay, to really get the party going, okay? Um, that's what he did. You know, and I want you to know, it would not have happened if those servants hadn't done what Jesus told them to do. See, Jesus, even at that point, was including them in the miracle he wanted to, to, to do. 
And um, it, it's interesting because in John it says they filled those containers to the brim. And I don't think that's not there by accident. Meaning they did what Jesus asked them to do to the, to the at maximum point they could. To the maximum point they could. And a miracle that happened. Water became wine. Now, Jesus told him, hey, now scoop out some water in a ladle and go show it, give it to the guy who's in charge, who doesn't know anything about where that's, this, this stuff is coming from, by the way. Okay? And so the, a servant had to dip a ladle in water, not knowing it was turning to wine, and walk over and have this guy taste it, going, well, here's this stuff we're going to serve. I mean, can you imagine how he was feeling? Okay? And we don't know when the miracle took place. Did it happen when the water went into the, those containers? It, um, I mean, I don't know about you. I don't have like 150 gallons of miracles I can dip into anytime I want, okay? Was it when they, they dipped the ladle in? Was it on the way over to the guy? Was it when he lifted it to his... We don't know when that miracle happened. But we know it happened when we were active in joining Jesus in what he was doing. That's when the miracle happened. Let me go back to my story about me. So I'm in that place where it, it was a real difficult time. Now, before my dad died, the, on Saturday before, we had seen him. But then my, my daughter said, hey, there's this, other, there's this other school district that's looking for a science teacher. It's a middle school. And, and so I said, well, I'll try. But it, there's no way I was going to get this job. It's a, it's a really sought-after school district to work at. There's no way they're going to hire me. So I started at the other school. And like, God, I, I trust you. You're going you're gonna to provide somehow, some way, another job or something. And, and then on, on Wednesday morning, my dad passed away. But then Wednesday afternoon, I got a call from that school. They're saying, hey, would you like to come in tomorrow for an interview? And long story short, I interviewed. I got the job. Four days later, I started working at the junior high school. Now, just because how they had the pay difference and what they do with people who don't have emergency credentials, all that stuff happened, I ended up making $16,000 more working for the middle school district than for the high school district, Okay. And, and, and they're a year round, so we should go from July. We don't go to school in July, not till August, but their year goes from July through June. And I started in August when I got my first paycheck at the end of August. They actually paid me for both July and August, which gave us enough money to get all caught up on where we were behind. Okay? And we just have to take those steps. Let me close with this. And my time is at zero, zero, colon, zero, zero. I just want you to know that, okay? Um, William Tyndale said this. He said, there is no work better than to please God. To pour water, to wash dishes, to be a cobbler or an apostle, all are the same. Uh, to, to wash dishes and to preach are all one. It comes down to this, touching the deed to please God. What makes the difference is why you do it. If you're doing what you do to please God out of a love for him, then it's all the same. Me preaching right now or me washing dishes is exactly the same. This is no better than anything else that anyone else does or when I'm doing something else. It's all the same when we do it with a heart and a love for Jesus and the people that we're serving. So the big question is, what is Jesus telling you to do? At this point, because there's no retirement in serving Jesus, okay? What is Jesus telling you to do? Okay, no matter what your age. And the question behind that is, do you trust Jesus with what he's asking you to do, even if it doesn't make sense? Mother Teresa said this, put yourself completely under the influence of Jesus so that he may think his thoughts in your mind, do his work through your hands, for you will be all powerful with him to strengthen you. Let him think his thoughts through your mind, let him do his work through your hands. This is a challenging time. And we live under a lot of pressure, and there's a lot of junk that wants to attach itself to us. But we can experience this benevolent, loving detachment away from things. And to empty ourselves of some of those things so that Jesus can fill us up. So we can experience that. Lovingly become untangled so that we can experience God's joy. Being caught in the flow, guys, because he wants... To live, you to live a freely, okay, and carefree when we trust in him. Let's pray. God, I love you. 
Whenever I say that, God, and especially in times like this, it just, it, those words don't always seem to express all that I feel and all that I want to express to you. But I thank you that we have those words and that, Father, more than our words, that we have the opportunity to say those things with our lives and in and, and, and how we, we take advantage of the moments that we have to serve the people that you have brought into our lives so that we might truly help them to understand exactly how much you love them. We thank you and we praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.